what is a watershed? Um, the area of land, a bounded hydrological system within which all living things are inextricably linked by their common water course and where as humans settled, simple logic demanded that they become part of a community. So it really just goes to show that we are one and all connected as we look at our different environments. So looking at Washington state, uh, we have many, many, many different rivers and lakes that are all interconnected and combined. And then getting a little bit closer, looking at Puget Sound and kind of central Puget Sound area, looking at some of the specific watersheds that are important to these areas. And you can see the Snoqualmie, Skykomish watershed, and then moving farther south, Sammamish, and then the Cedar River, Lake Washington watershed are really the ones that are the areas around um, the areas that you guys are living in currently. And they all kind of flow down into the rivers and then once again into the lakes and then all the way flowing out to the Puget Sound. So everything is a little bit connected, which is why it's so important for all of us to have an idea of how they're, they're combined. So when thinking about describing a watershed, we are not also are not only thinking about the physical, but also how they may be are human managed. So thinking about the topography, the hydrology of that area, the ecology of the land, the infrastructure that is on those sites, the different demographics that are within those areas, how the land is being used. So is it a farmland or is it an urban environment? And then also just the socio political priorities within those areas. These all have different impacts and changes within the different watersheds and how they are managed and how they are adjusted over time. So it's important to think about all of this when we're thinking about our, our different watershed environments. So when thinking about the hydrological cycle, it's important to think how this water moves through. I'm gonna actually go back See that slows down. There we go. So it evaporates up, moves across our clouds, and then as it goes over the mountains, it starts to create um, some rain, and then it runs down, and then it you either have runoff that comes off, or it's going to be fully absorbed down into our soil, and then run back out into our oceans. So this is how we get most of our water as it comes down and moves through the different areas. So this is important to think about with those watersheds, how they start in the mountains, work through the rivers, move down into our lakes and the different streams. So continuing through, look, thinking about erosion control. And so when we look at shorelines um, and even thinking about streamside areas, um, thinking about the vegetation that we have in our areas, whether you have little or have just removed a bunch of vegetation, this can increase runoff by removing some of those root systems. If you have really porous soil, the water will run right through and can oftentimes increase erosion. Um, having a bluff or some sort of steep surface um, will oftentimes create an unstable environment, which also with our heavy rains, without having any way to hold the soil in place, having those really saturated soils oftentimes on those steep slopes means that we're prone to having soil slide and create some different issues down the road. Living in a shoreline area, you have waves that may come up and start to undercut or create some even sharper areas, which will then also cause some areas for erosion to continue to move down. And you'll see these oftentimes in rivers, also on different bends as they come through looking at from spring to summer to winter as the water rises and falls you're going to have different areas where you might have some some bluffs or some little kind of areas that get undercut which will then cause erosion problems down the road and so we're going to go through different ways to minimize this so one of the ways that you can help minimize and one thing that we really like to look at is specifically around vegetation so the roots of trees and shrubs and even smaller grasses hold surface soil in place and help to stabilize bank materials. It helps to absorb that groundwater so that we don't have those extra saturated soils. It slows down the amount of water that is kind of moving through and it helps absorb the energy of the rain by blocking those droplets so they're not smashing down in the same spot over and over again. 
And then also as the water from the soil, um, it removes the water from the soil as it transpires into the air. So it's allowing kind of some of that water to be able to go right back into the system. So the evaporation from the foliage, having those roots hold it in place, having a combination or a diversity of deep roots and surface roots or shallower roots really help to hold the different soil in place. Another thing to think about is our healthy soil. So really trying to encourage and increase healthy soil since having really com um, either loose or really compact soil is hard for roots to penetrate. And so it's important to build that healthy soil. It also helps to reduce the amount of need for chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Our healthy soil is kind of like the immune system for our plants. So it's important to be able to do that. It reduces the amount of extra stuff we have to add in if we have a good base for all these plants to grow in the first place. And because of that higher organic matter with building healthy soil, we don't have to irrigate as often because healthy soil, high organic matter helps to hold water in place. It also helps to filter out pollutants. So it's kind of like our natural filtration system as stuff is going through, it's holding on and it's pulling out those nutrients before it gets out into our streams and our lakes and our different watersheds. Helps to sequester stormwater. So as it's running down the streets or coming off our roofs, that soil, the where the grass is growing, where the trees are, it's helping to slow that process down so it's not overflowing our systems. And then also just soil is one of the, is a very large carbon source or carbon store from the atmosphere too. So it's also important in slowing down the climate change problems that we're having. Looking at mulch options. So as we mentioned, maybe you can't have vegetation everywhere. Maybe you can't have trees and shrubs. So making sure that you're mulching and covering those areas to reduce the amount of water that is potentially penetrating and moving down. So some different options, looking at wood chips, and these are great for perennials, um, tree and shrub beds as ground covers and pathways, and really try not to leave any area bare as bare soil. Compost is excellent for vegetable gardens and also annual beds that need maybe more nutrients because they're growing so quickly in a single season. Straw is an excellent source just to help kind of break up the water droplets and protect it from heavy rains for vegetable gardens and also annual beds. Uh, it takes a longer time to break down than something like compost. So it's something you can use sometimes for multiple seasons. Leaves are excellent for all areas. They are kind of almost a free compost to be able to add or a free mulch. As they break down, they start to create some really great microbes and some really good nutrients that are then fully broken down into your beds later on. There's obviously different commercial mixes that you can buy from stores, such as different manures or wood products, um, different composts. Sheet mulching is a technique if you're really trying to transform a weedy or a really grass infested area um, and train it, transition it into a different type of an area, or if you're just trying to continue to add to the healthy soil. And this is kind of like a lasagna layer of um, compost, cardboard, and wood chips or soil. So you're layering that system to create the um, healthy soil over, over time. And then lastly, cover crops. And there's a small example here in the top left picture of cover crops in a vegetable bed. And these are annual crops such as in the legume family like Austrian peas or vetch or clover or some different cereal crops such as rye um, or wheat. And these are really used to help protect the soil, add nutrients back into the soil, and then also um, add organic matter in the springtime when you turn them back in. So some specific erosion plants, plants that do well for stream sides, um, some of the evergreen trees such as the red cedar and also the Douglas fir, some of the different deciduous trees, willows, paper birch, alders, deciduous shrubs, such as the dogwood, bitter cherry, and vine maple. These are just some great examples of some native plants that we have around that do really good with their root systems to help hold and stabilize those different stream side areas. And then looking at shoreline, shorelines oftentimes need a little bit, have a little bit more extreme environments. So maybe a little bit saltier or even more wind coming through more exposed areas. So madrones, shore pines, sitka spruce are some other options to add in. Cascara and big leaf maple are both really great deciduous trees. Salau, orange grape, huckleberry are 
great shrubs to be able to put in multiple different areas. And then with deciduous shrubs, um, once again, ocean spray, vine maple, service berry, and snowberry are all really great options. So next, thinking about habitat creation. And this is really thinking about a habitat as an environment that is occupied by a particular species of a plant, animal, or any kind, any other kind of organism. And when thinking about habitat, we have kind of four main ingredients is kind of one way to think about it. Food, and this can be anything from nectar to specific fruits or even plants that larvae are feasting on or feeding on specifically. Shelter, thinking about canopies, soil, types of plants. Water, um, people often forget about water for some of our wildlife animals, but they're also very important. And then also nesting sites because these animals need to have something to be able to continue to raise their young so that they can continue to stay around and have a home. So first thing about food, um, we often try to get people and try and focus on native plants. Different birds and beneficial insect, insects instinctively recognize their the nectar, fruit, or seeds from those native plants. They also are starting to realize um, and know that some of those plants also are harboring their prey or the food sources, maybe if it's not a fruit or a seed, something like an aphid that is normally going to be on a certain plant, they're going to start to recognize that. Um, with our native plants, they are adapted to our environment. So they are used to our wet winters and our dry summers. So they don't need as much care if they are put in the environment that they're meant to be in. And they generally don't need as much maintenance to take care of them also if they are planted in an area that will allow them to get to their full size and full potential. So they're a little bit easier sometimes to take care of. Oftentimes with our food, so we mentioned the natives are very important because we are in an urban environment and an environment where landscaping um, and kind of beautifying our spaces is something that we all enjoy. There is also a lot of non-natives that can also provide food that have just been planted around for many years that many of our native animals are starting to recognize. And so it is also helpful to make sure you have some of those other ones too, um, to be able to have that diversity in there. So when we're thinking about trying to choose different types of plants, we really want to try and find things that have multiple sources. So something that might have nectar and fruit um, or nectar and seeds can be really helpful because they're providing nutrients to different animals at different times of the year, um, such as goldfinches, which are a common bird that we have here. They will actually eat the seed heads from the black eyed Susans in the fall. Whereas they are also very important for a lot of our bees in the summertime and a lot of our beneficial insects. So it's important to kind of think about that when we're planting think about how they will last throughout the year and how they're benefiting much multiple different types of organisms. Um, a lot of times too, uh, we want to leave. So as I mentioned, the seed heads, so it's kind of like not being too tidy and leaving some stuff, leaving some seed heads and letting things go to fruit because you are benefiting multiple different types of animals. Just some of the different types of birds that are really important in the Northwest and in this area. Um, birds not only are eating seeds and nectar, they're also a lot of them are eating insects and oftentimes it's the babies that are eating the insects. So the chickadee, um, the young are the ones that are eating the insects and the adults are eating seeds. So they're also focusing on two different types of environments and two different types of food sources. Swallows are eating mosquitoes. The bush tit is traveling in large flocks to find seeds and insects. The wren needs a really dense cover. So thinking about the different type of environments that they're living in that are also looking at different types of insects. The flickers are not only eating ants, but also other soil insects. Sparrows are eating a lot of different grass and weed seeds house finch, weeds, and then also dandelions and thistle. Um, the junco has a diet of a variety of different grasses, different shrubs and conifers, and the tohi eats lots of different grasses, weeds, and also insects. So we have lots of different types of birds out here to help with controlling not only some of our pests that we have, but also some of the different weeds that we may have also. 
Some other types of wildlife that maybe we don't always think about. Um, we know that bats are around. We don't normally see them because they are around at night, but they're eating anywhere between 600 to 1,000 insects per hour. And so we need to think about with habitat, having a space for them to be able to, to roost or to live. So whether that's creating one yourself or having trees that are available for them. The hoverfly, which um, I will talk more about at the class on this weekend, um, but the hoverflies are a, a mimicking type of a fly that resemble a yellow jacket. And they actually are, their larvae specifically are a huge predator of aphids. And the adults are really important to pollinate our different flowers. And then our blue herons are eating really much of the larger insects and then also making sure that we have the tree spaces for them to nest in. So it's important to think about habitat in all of the different realms and not just one, one factor. So shelter. So as we mentioned, animals have different types of environments they need. They all need different ways to kind of survive and live. So thinking about planting trees and shrubs in what we call a hedgerow style to mimic a forest edge habitat. So this is having different layers, different levels, um, not just one kind of straight line going across and having things kind of overlap and kind of interspersed. Having a mixture of evergreen and deciduous plants. It not only is giving you interest throughout the year, it's also providing habitat, nesting sites, potential food sources and shelter um, for animals all throughout the year, the, all the seasons. So as I mentioned, different variety of heights and forms for multiple layers of the habitat, um, different canopies, different types of leaf structures and different types of branches. And then also the informal planting style and maintenance. And this is what animals are used to. They're not used to a very structured environment. So having that informal type of environment is going to be a way to encourage more wildlife in your own garden. So some of the native plants that have um, some important aspects to different wildlife, such as the cherry, the willow, crabapple, serviceberry, rose, mahonia, salal, huckleberry, elderberry, currant dogwood, spirea, penstemon, fescue, ceanothus, ocean spray, mock orange, aster, viola, goldenrod, lupin, and iris. So this goes everywhere from tree all the way down to perennials as we go down some of um, the things that I'm seeing right now. And so within these pictures, we have the rose up top, which during the summer, you have the nice flowers that are great for pollinators. And then as you move toward into fall, you end up having the rose hips, which are um, great for a lot of different birds and other animals. And as people, you can harvest them. They're very high in vitamin C and they're really great as teas as you dry them. With the Mahonia, which is down below, um, the, the berries are actually edible, but the flowers are really important pollinator or a pollen source and nectar source for hummingbirds in the wintertime when there's not many other things blooming. So one of those things to just kind of have in mind and keep around when you're designing the yard. So not only the, the native plants, the taller shrubs and trees, but also really important to attract our beneficial insects. And we have three main families we generally talk about. There are obviously others out there, but some of the ones that we see the most impact on increasing pollinators and beneficial insects. And when I say beneficial insects, this is not only pollinators, it's also some of our predatory insects that are eating some of the pests that we might have. So the aster family, which is the, or the asteracea family, which is the daisy family. So think of anything that has kind of a sunflower or a daisy look. So calendula, zinnia, marigold, sunflower, echinacea, and asters, just a few examples. The lineacea family or the mint family. So the lavenders, the rosemary, sage, mint, oregano, catnip, and basil. And then our Apiacea family or the carrot family. So this is our umbrella type flower family. So cilantro, dill, fennel, carrot, parsley, and Queen Anne's lace are some of the examples with that. So oftentimes what I'll do is I'll let maybe some of my cilantro or my carrots go to seed in my vegetable garden to help attract some of these insects. Um, oftentimes it's our, our smaller, so you can see here this honeybee is on what I think is fennel right there with my 
cilantro and my carrot when it goes to seed or the parsley you'll see the the very very tiny parasitic wasp that show up on those guys um, bumblebees loved the lavender and bumblebees are very important to excuse me to pollinate our tomatoes so lavender is a great one to have around it smells good also so shelter so kind of continuing on thinking about shelter, um, it's important to think about the different types of shelter that you may have. So it's not only a, a large tree that you're trying to protect something in, it's also for some of the different stages of, of animals. So our lady beetles, or what people often think of as lady ladybugs, they lay eggs in different types of grasses oftentimes, or long skinny types of leaves and they pupate on those leaves so it's a little hard to see in this picture but the little tiny orange dots on there that is the the pupate um, life cycle time of a ladybug or a lady beetle and so from that stage they will then transform into the adult lady beetle and they're really important for eating aphids so it's a good one to have around so if you see those little guys don't don't hurt them let them be um, they're they're doing their kind of inner work to be able to turn into what will help eat stuff in the garden. Garter snakes, um, I know a lot of people can be very scared of them, but they are really, really excellent for eating slugs and snails. So they're important to have around and they need grassy areas and warm sunning spots. And then also kind of piles of rocks or um, branches to be able to actually hide under. And then bumblebees actually nest in more bare or lightly covered soil so not really thick mulch um, but kind of some little bits of mulch and that's where they're actually nesting so unlike something like a honeybee or a wasp that's up in the trees or higher up bumblebees are actually in the ground so as i mentioned don't be overly tidy so thinking about leaving some some hollow stems that maybe could help with some insects that lay eggs in hollow stems. Um, a lot of the different types of beetles that we have that are actually really good at eating slugs and snails um, tend to overwinter under old plant debris on the ground or old tumps, like a bunch of leaves or type of mulches. Um, also thinking about the seed heads. So we mentioned the, um, the finches and the um, some of the other birds that will end up eating the different seed heads. We also have hummingbirds that will actually use the fluff or the seed um, the seed fluff from anemones in the winter time um, for their nest to actually add a little bit of cushion to it. So it's important to think about that when we're leaving some of the different types of plants that we have around in our garden. We can also help to create some areas. Sometimes in these urban environments, we don't have the perfect spot for some of these different types of animals. So adding in different types of nesting boxes, um, roosting boxes for birds, bats, and insects can be really important to help encourage the different wildlife. It is very specific to the size and the shape of boxes for many different birds. So it's important to look at different sites like maybe the Audubon Society, um, and I think we have some links in the resources on the Bothell website too for some of the different places you can look at this. But it's important to find the right size and placement so that you are making sure that you're attracting the, the different animals. Thinking about not pruning um, during nesting season so that you're not disrupting those birds as they are or the different animals as they are in those areas. Um, be conservative with pruning and leaving a few dead twigs as some of those dead twigs are providing not only nesting sites, but also sometimes bugs or something else for some of those different birds. Wood chips and leaves are great for different beneficial insects. So as I mentioned, some of our different beetle, our ground beetles are generally gonna be living underneath those. And then hollow stems, um, something that I've seen is like a, the different types of sedums. They're nice hollow stems when, this, when the plant dies off and leaving those stems about a foot tall, you'll see a lot of different types of bees that will end up nesting in those and overwintering. So another kind of important thing to think about when you're, when you're looking at cutting back or tidying and cleaning up your yard. So as I mentioned, uh, many of our different types of animals do nest in different cavities in trees. So it's hard to find 
dead wood for them to be in. So finding some ways that you can add a box. Different types of bee boxes that are specific to the type of bee. So mason bees need a certain size hole and they are generally out flying around from February to June. Whereas our leaf cutter bee, which is another one of our native pollinator bees is out from June to about September and they need a smaller hole. So thinking about that when you're putting placements of different size boxes and different placements around where you have them. And then I asked, as I mentioned, rock piles um, or sticks and stuff are good for snakes. And then also the bumblebees need those kind of cleared spaces with little kind of nooks that they can kind of hide under. So part of why we are always trying to focus on our native bees, um, they do forage earlier in the season than many of the honey bees. So they're one of the first ones that come out in February, oftentimes maybe, maybe March, depending on how cold, how cold it actually is. Um, they are out longer, so earlier in the day and later at night. So they spend more time out than some of the honey bees. They're also better at adapting to the cooler and cloudier weather because they are native. So honeybees are not native and our other bees are used to our weather similar to our native plants are. There's a lot of competition on the same flowers, which can cause honeybees to continue to move more frequently, which can help with plants that need to have pollen taken from one flower to the next to help it be pollinated. Um, insurance policy like everything so having diversity we never want to have just one type of animal out there that we're focusing on because as we all know um, having one type of thing is never good we want to have that diversity especially in nature because we never know what the climate's going to do we never know what weather is going to do um, or if there's some sort of disease or a, other issue that could potentially happen so helping to increase bee habitat um, and will really help with not only pest production and pollination um, of flowers, but also for a lot of our different crops. So things like our squashes um, are actually have a, a male flower and a female flower. So a bee has to go from one flower to the next flower to make sure that it's pollinated so you can then have say a zucchini or a, or a pumpkin. Whereas something like a tomato, the male and female parts of the flower on the same flower, but the way the flower is shaped, it's very tight, um, all squeezed together. And so a bee, like a bumblebee that shakes a lot is actually moving that pollen better um, than if it was just to have nothing and just the air moving it. So it's important to have these different animals. They are, they know what they're doing. They're going around and they're way better at it, way better at it than we ever will be. Specifically think about amphibians. So living near stream sides, um, oftentimes you're gonna have more amphibians around um, in wetter environments. They need oftentimes some type of a fat, uh, dry, flat ground. And with a, sh a pretty shallow slope of only around 6%. Um, the steeper it is, it's harder for them to get in and out. And it's not very normal for where they would naturally be. And then think about what type of wetland you want. So different types of animals are going to be attracted to different types of environments. So we call it a thermal wetland or a vernal pond, which only end up retaining water for portions of the year. So thinking of like a, a wet spring that would be there versus a drier, um, maybe an area would dry out during the summertime. So you would might have a breeding ground in the springtime and then the animal would end up moving on after that. So you can start by trying to dig a shallow hole and then oftentimes there's different types of pond liners that are safe for animals that you can line it with to help hold that water in place. Looking at some type of sticks or um, plants that you can kind of plant around it to help protect them from any sort of predators. Putting in native plants, avoiding any sort of weed killers or pesticides and also adding any sort of fish or frogs because they will be competing with those animals for the food sources that they need. So as I mentioned, water is something we don't often think about all the time when we're thinking about trying to provide habitat for animals, but it is essential for not only birds, but also for bats and for all different types of insects. Um, obviously the native type of environment that they're looking for, creeks or ponds are gonna be best, but also um, having some sort of bird bath or some sort of water feature will also help. Make sure they have shallow slopes because it is hard for them to get in and out um, if they're very steep. 
And then making sure you're cleaning them because these are man-made environments. Um, the buildup of allergy or other types of um, bacteria can be really harmful for these different types of animals. So moving on to integrated pest management. So integrated pest management is a sustainable approach to managing pests by combining biological, cultural, physical, and chemical tools in a way that minimizes economic, health, and environmental risks. So why do we focus on this? So we do this because pesticides were designed to kill organisms, um, which had an increase in pesticide use of close to 170% 170 between 1964 and 1982. Within that time, U.S. crop production had a 37% reduction by the negative effects of, um, of pests. And then that has kind of stayed stable over the course of much of our agriculture. Unfortunately, pesticides use non-target organisms at risk. So um, including us and families and pets. So they're generally, they have a broader impact than just the one specific thing that they're concentrating on. They have, generally around a 5% active ingredient versus the 95% inert ingredients, which are not required to be listed necessarily and also can be trade secrets. So with the combination of them and also the higher levels of them, they can also be toxic. So in general, it's good to stay away from any sort of chemicals as much as you possibly can so that we aren't um, putting more potential harm to us and the environment. The toxicity of the materials used, the length and intensity of the exposure to the materials is what can oftentimes have the greatest risk to all of us. So when we think about IPM, the original intent of pesticides and chemicals was for complete eradication. Um, what we've come to learn over time is that a new system of control. So looking at different types of techniques um, and pesticides that were maybe not quite so harsh. And then continuing to evolve and to learn, we realize that it's really best to focus on more how nature works and return to a balance um, and focus on how an ecosystem actually works so that we're not completely eliminating something since there ends up actually being negative effects down the road. So one of the main focuses is prevention. So this is what we do when we're gardening. We're preventing some of these major problems in the first place. We're building that healthy soil by adding compost um, and helping to create, build that immune system for these plants. We wanna make sure we're putting the right plant in the right place. So making sure you're putting a plant that needs sun in the sun, putting a plant that needs shade in the shade, a plant that likes more of a wet environment in that environment. Um, you will help to put the plant in the right place. It will have less disease and less pest issues, and you will not be fighting trying to keep it alive. Create a di diverse landscape, and you're attracting all different types of wildlife and different types of animals, which are going to help to kind of manage a lot of the issues that potentially could be there in the first place for you. Mulching not only is preventing and helping with erosion control, but it's also helping to prevent weeds from coming up and it's helping to conserve moisture in the soil by reducing the amount of evaporation that might be um, from the sun in the summertime, which then reduces the amount of stress on the different types of plants. Watering properly. So deeply and in the morning is ideal. Um, it helps to kind of give plants what they need throughout the day and gets those roots to go nice and deep into the soil. And then if you do see any sort of diseased or pest infested plant material, um, really keeping an eye on that and removing it from the landscape or removing the parts of it that are infected so that you're not spreading it around to the different areas. So next is observation. Um, and this is really important for I think everybody to just take a little bit more time walking through your garden and learning about the different plants that you have, um, knowing where they originally came from. If they aren't native to here, where'd they come from? understanding their size and their shape, what their types of needs are, learning about the different life cycles of different pests. Um, so as you can see on the side here, we have a stink bug that goes through pretty much uh, from egg to a small stink bug and then getting up almost in the same type of a shape versus something like a butterfly that goes from egg to a larva stage 
to a pupa to then completely transforming into a butterfly. So knowing their life cycles will help you to understand how they are going to evolve in the garden and also what plants they may be attracted to or where you'll end up finding them. Thinking about the different life cycles of weeds. So we have weeds that are going to be annuals, which means they're only going to be here for one season. We have biennial weeds, which means they begin their life cycle in one year and then they finish it the second year. And then we have perennials that keep coming back year after year. Do they have a tap root or a fibrous root system? It's going to determine how you tackle them and how you are able to um, control them and manage them over time. And then tolerance. Um, tolerance is important because we are so used to eradicating or making everything look perfect that we forget that sometimes things aren't going to be perfect. We, we have Nature is not perfect. Nothing is perfect. So we need to make sure that we have a little bit of tolerance. Is the damage just slightly cosmetic or, if it, or is it going to actually hurt the plant and cause more problems down the road? Um, is it just a couple of black spots on the leaf or is the entire thing covered in um, some sort of fungal issue? Is the plant going to have this be temporary and then will it come back after the fact? Um, so when I think about that, I think about some of the different rusts that come on some of our plants because of our cool springs and our wet springs or our falls. So we have some plants that are susceptible different, to different types of rusts. But if you cut the foliage back um, at a certain time, it'll come back and it'll be just fine and then you don't have to worry about it. And then also is the plant worth keeping and continuing to treat? So is the plant... Um, a really important plant to you and if it is then maybe you need to move it to a different spot because it's not happy where it is um, maybe you need to look at some of the different reasons that it might be continuing to have a problem uh, maybe the soil needs to be changed or, or adjusted maybe it, there needs to be more sun or it's too wet of an environment um, also maybe the plant just will not work in your garden and it's time to be able to let go and find something else that will do better in that space um, continuing to fight it is going to never have it be a healthy plant and it's also a lot of stress on you to be able to maintain and take care of it. And then lastly intervention um, and so like we said so thinking about do we need to remove that plant? Do you need to move it to a new place? Do you need to get rid of it completely? Um, looking at those cultural conditions so it's soil, it's water, it's sun type of environment. Um, is there some types of hands-on treatment you can do, um, mechanical such as removing or cutting different parts off of it? Looking at some of the different biological types of um, types of, of controls can be something like um, the BT. There's a, um, a a bacteria that you can spray that can actually kill some of our different types of insects that we have, um, different types of worms, oftentimes. There's some different types of soil organisms that you can put in the ground, which sometimes will then eat different types of grubs. Um, so thinking about some of those different types of options that are out there. And then chemical, and this is really the last, last, last resort. Um, and even, even organic, even natural ones are still chemicals and can have a negative effect. So like I said, doing everything else first to make sure um, that it's really what you need to do. So those cultural, adjust your watering, prune for airflow, fertilizing, looking at the, ch the trunk flare on trees to making sure they're not buried too much under compost or mulch. Mechanical, hand removing the pests, um, pulling the weeds before they go to seed, using slug traps. Biological, so the different bacteria, fungi, or other biological sources. So the BTK that I just mentioned um, can control tent caterpillars. And then as always, chemicals, last resort, and use the lowest toxicity product um, that you absolutely can. So another reason to avoid our chemicals um, because of these lovely little animals that we have here. So it can, if you have used chemicals in the past, it can take an adjustment period because oftentimes with chemicals are native predators, uh, different insects or birds or whatever that might be helping to control the different pests have are not there or they're in limited supply. And so once you stop using those chemicals, you might need to have 
a little bit of patience to let those different types of animals move back in to help take over. Um, it really is important to think about our water quality and to protect not only the birds, but also the salmon, um, different populations that we have because they are, are all very much impacted by different types of pesticides and chemicals. So next, looking at pollutants. So the impact of pesticides on the environment. So this is a, a lot of information all on one slide, but pretty much what we're looking at here is how um, different pesticides or chemicals are being moved around um, our watersheds and our different areas. So as they're being added on, say, um, I mean, it could be anything from, from dog poop, from big urban environments or dog parks, or from a golf course, or from a farm as you're adding these different chemicals they're going down into your streams and they're coming down they're evaporating up into the air they're going through and they're moving back through over our mountains or over our different areas turning into precipitation coming back down going back down and circling all over again so it's a continual supply of just moving things around so it's really important to think about that that whatever you're putting in your own space is not only impacting that direct area, it's impacting everything um, around you. So I um, spoke to somebody from the Bothell Surface Water Team and she gave me the top pollutants that are in the area um, and some of the ways that people can help with managing that. So one of the ones she mentioned was bacteria such as E. coli. And this oftentimes is coming from waste from humans or other warm blooded animals and then also failing septic systems. So the Department of Ecology re recently adopted E. coli in the freshwater quality criteria for bacteria and fecal coliform is no longer assessed. E. coli is an accurate indicator of bacteria related to illness from contact with polluted waters. So some of the different management techniques you can do is to help pick up waste from your pets maintaining those septic systems and also to avoid feeding ducks and other waterfowl that are collecting or concentrating in um, different lakes and stream areas. Different nutrients, and this is oftentimes thinking about different types of fertilizers. So um, it's important to get your soil tested before you're adding a whole bunch of nutrients and making sure you're following the recommendations on the backs of those bags and what your soil test has said different animal and human waste, so failing septic systems, and then also high levels of phosphorus from dishwashing detergent, which also high levels of phosphorus for lawn fertilizer too. Um, so making sure you're thinking about that before you're adding any types of fertilizers and also what products you're even using within your own dishwasher. What this does is it impacts streams and lakes by high, um, causing an increase in algal, um, algal bloom, which ends up decreasing um, in dissolved oxygen due to microbial respiration, which then reduces the oxygen that is in our lakes and causes issues with the different um, animals and organisms that are living there. So the best things you can do with that is to do some of these different natural yard care techniques that we're talking about, picking up your pet waste, which includes chickens, and then also maintaining septic, septic systems, and then making sure you're taking your cars to car washes and not washing them in your own yards, since oftentimes those are the water is running straight into our sewer systems, which is causing problems down the road. Suspended sediments. So these are um, in streams due to eroding slopes and different landscaping of activities where all of the vegetation has been removed. So different construction projects and also um, bare dirt on roadways. What happens is that the elevated sediment in streams has a direct effect on different aquatic organisms and creates habitat or stream beds that are unsuitable for salmon spawning. So looking at reducing the amount of exposed soil that you have by applying straws, mulches, um, or even, um, she said tarps, but also thinking about burlap bags in areas to reduce the amount of sediment that may be moving down into the streams. And then looking at stabilizing those stream banks with um, native ground covers or even putting some sort of large wood debris to help break the amount of um, potential erosion that might be happening. And then lastly, um, elevated temperatures and dissolved oxygen. So while 
water temperature is not necessarily a pollutant. It is having a direct effect on our urban watersheds. So with the stream temperatures increasing due to a lot of tree shading, to loss of tree shading, and the increase in pervious surfaces, such as roads and parking lots, the rainwater flows through street catch basins and pipes, which lead straight into bothel streams instead of filtering through the groundwater. So thinking about how our watersheds are moving through and where we want our water to go right back to where it was first intended to go. So once this the stream temperatures rise above 16 degrees Celsius or 60 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer or 55 degrees for the remaining months, the survival of native fish in aquatic communities becomes challenging. Those elevated temperatures have effect on the dissolved oxygen, which interfere with development of embryonic juvenile growth and adult migration of these native fish. Um, so really looking at adding more shade coverings around streams, adding vegetation to help with that. And so lastly, looking at pests and weeds. Um, so some of the common pests that we have in our kind of urban, urban environments, um, and these aren't necessarily stream side specific as much as just stuff you're gonna end up finding in the Northwest in your, your backyards or your front yards. So white flies can be really common um, on a lot of different types of vegetable gardens and oftentimes it's from crowded and overly stressed plants. You can put yellow sticky traps up to track the different population numbers, but it's really important to, to look at why the plants are stressed. Um, sometimes the white flies will come towards the end of fall when weather starts to change a bit and the plants have been growing for a longer period of time. Lace bugs you're going to find on azaleas and rhododendrons a lot and oftentimes also stressed plants and overly crowded. So improve air circulation, check the health of the soil and the plants. Um, there's a lot of beneficial insects that will help to control them and then making sure that they're fertilized correctly. Spider mites um, are what you see in this bottom picture here. So oftentimes stressed plants, but also really dry conditions. So checking the health of soil, of soil and plants, mulch to help reduce the amount of dry soil and holding that moisture in. And then oftentimes you'll see this next to um, like air vents, um, next to houses where there's just constantly a dry air blowing on the plants. That's where oftentimes you'll see this. Deer um, is still considered a pest. Um, they're gonna go after tender new growth. So looking at different resistant varieties, Sometimes sprinklers can help to scare them away or eight foot tall fences. Um, aphids um, love our tender new growth and also when plants are overly stressed. So different beneficial insects also doing some mechanical just rinsing off the plants since they have some life stages that aren't as um, they can't move as much, so just spraying them off oftentimes will help to keep them at bay. Slugs and snails like cool, damp areas. They love our springs um, when it's nice and cool outside. Um, sprinkling eggshells or oyster shells around your plants, building a slug trap like you see here with a little bit of um, a yeast mixture or an old beer, a little bit of old beer. The slugs will crawl into and end up drowning in that. Imported cabbage butterfly, like we see here, loves brassicas. So thinking about that with the types of plants that you have. Um, and then also when they're overly crowded, it gives them good hiding spots. So putting a little bit of a floating row cover in and also a lot of different beneficial insects and then also crop rotation. Since they're used to those brassicas, moving them around your garden and not only having them in the same place will help to reduce the, the amount of them. Rabbits and squirrels. Um, they like a lot of different new growth. Squirrels specifically love the bulbs and just digging holes in everything. Um, there is not any like real tried and true um, putting up short fences around them, bird netting to help cover plants when they're newer. And then also a cayenne pepper spray. They don't like the spice, um, the capsaicin. So that can also help to keep them, keep them away. So moving into weeds, um, thinking about the noxious weed law. So it requires property owners to control and stop the spread of certain types of designated noxious weeds on their properties, um, both aquatic and non-aquatic. 
And so what they're looking at here is the different classes. So we have class A weeds, which are the highest priority statewide, and that's generally because they are highly limited in distribution. So these are things that haven't yet gone everywhere. Um, it's easiest for um, state and counties to be able to control and eradicate them before they start to be a huge problem. Class B weeds have a split distribution and controls required only where they are not already widespread. So thinking about that and then class C weeds are the most widespread and their control is typically not required, although recommended where possible. Um, it costs a lot of money to maintain and to get rid of weeds. And so they really try and focus on the priorities where they're gonna have the highest impact if they continue to grow um, and spread. So when thinking about weeds, um, a weed is just any plant growing in the wrong place. So not everybody wants to hear that, but it is true. Um, they can be useful sometimes, um, such as the clover. Clover is a nitrogen fixer, so it's actually adding nitrogen into your soil. They can be vectors for other problems. Um, so something like a lot of different mustards can also harbor the same types of chemicals or can cause the same types of problems. Um, for some of our brassicas, um, because they're in the same family, they can also cause, cause some issues down the road. They can also be indicators of what your soils are. And this is, I think, something that's really important to think about. If you have dead nettle, which is the plant on the upper left coming up, it generally is popping up in more currently disturbed and high moisture areas. You also have the plantain, um, which is gonna show up in wet waterlogged soils. And another one that's gonna be probably a really common one for people to see is the buttercup. And the buttercup comes up in more acidic and compact wet soils. So when thinking about this, um, changing the soils are how you're going to be able to control the plants in the long run, because they're always going to find a way to come back unless you can change those soils and change the environment that they are growing in. So there is always something to take into consideration, um, specifically with aquatic environments. Oftentimes you do need a permit to be able to do a lot of work because they are growing in what is generally considered easily disturbed or sensitive environments. So it's important to look at the regulations within your area um, before you start just removing a whole bunch of, of large material. Plants that are growing in water at minimum, you need a pamphlet hydraulic project approval free permit from the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And there are rules regarding aquatic herbicide use or admin, um, that are administered by the Washington Department of Ecology and also the Washington Department of Agriculture. So making sure you know those um, in, that information before you start doing a lot of big removal is really important. Um, it's important to take care of a lot of um, weeds that are along our waterways because they're displacing native plants and also fish and wildlife habitat. And it can be also damaging to commercial and sport fishing. It reduces recreational activities such as boating and swimming areas, clogs irrigation and drinking water structures, and also reduces um, or decreases water quality. So looking at some of the main weeds that are impacting our different waterways, um, it's a lot of information in here. So just kind of highlighting through the common reed. Um, it oftentimes is impacting wildlife displacement and also water quality deterioration. So some of the best ways to control it is just to cut it down before the end of July, which is when most of the food reserves are produced um, so that you're kind of slowing down the growth of that um, specific plant. The garden loose strife um, forms really dense stands along wetlands and shorelines. And you can actually cover the areas with plastic um, or heavy tarp, and that will end up kind of um, shading out the plant to end up killing it. The purple loose strife dominates wetlands and impedes water flows. Um, it also has a really prolific seed production, which um, unfortunately displaces native vegetation and food sources. Um, there is a two foliar feeding beetle that has been really effective um, in some of the different types of biological agents for controlling that. And you can see some more information about that specifically um, at the oregonstate.edu website. Reed canary grass outcompetes native species um, and also reduces the wildlife habitat because of that. 
Um, so mowing it or getting it down, cutting it down multiple times, removing the seed heads before it matures um, really helps to control that plant over time. Um, our knotweed is becoming a real problem by displacing native plants. Um, it also grows quite rapidly and it's competing for water and nutrients in our different types of aquatic systems. And actually repeatedly cutting it down can actually be really effective um, as a removal technique. The field horsetail, um, this is one that's been coming up in um, questions from from different workshops and also just calls that we've been getting in. Um, the horsetail can be toxic to livestock. Um, generally, they're not gonna eat it as much as it's causing problems with water flow. Um, it reduces crop yields and also can be um, just really annoying because it keeps coming back in your yard. So repeatedly mowing and cutting of the fertile fronds, which are the ones, the brown ones on the right here. So that is the fertile frond Whereas the green one on the left is the sterile frond. So completing to cut the furrow frond back after two weeks of them emerging or before they reach six inches tall helps to reduce the food storage that they have in their rhizomes down below. So they do have a lot of rhizomes and hold a lot of food sources down there. So it's important to keep up on that. And then also because they don't have any real good leaves, planting with a whole bunch of stuff around them will also help to shade them out. They are also, which I didn't put in here, um, they grow where it's really compact and wet areas. So once again, looking at that soil health and adjusting the soil in that area um, is another way to be able to counteract them. I did find out from somebody because I know that they are really hard to get away, that they are very high in silica. And so what you can do is actually take them and grind them up and put them in water and let them sit overnight and then take that water and add it as a fertilizer to fruit trees um, because fruit trees need, especially apple trees, need a lot of silica um, to produce their fruit. So a way that you can use it as you're trying to get rid of it. The yellow flag iris um, can be um, bad for livestock and it's also its resins can cause an ir skin irritation. They're also kind of taking over a lot of our ditches that we are ha that we have around. So pulling or digging the plants, but because they do have that resin that can cause a skin irritation, it's important to be very careful about that when you are removing them. The water lilies are restricting different lakefront access um, and out competing with native aquatic vegetation. So removing the leaves as they emerge will help to kill the plants. Um, and then once again, just because these are in um, generally fully aquatic areas, be very careful about if any permits are required for them in those specific areas. Um, the Eurasian water milfoil and the Brazilian elodia um, both form really dense mats that can shade out other native aquatic plants, which is causing problems with impacting recreational activities and inhibiting water flow. They actually do very well by just putting large sheets of a woven material over the top of them to actually completely shade them out. That can help to really control them. Butterfly bush, um, although it is pretty and does attract a lot of pollinators, uh, it is rapidly displacing native um, plants along different waterways. And you see it a lot of times down different types of rivers and also along different streams. Um, so it's really important if you do have these, remove the flowers as soon as they are done blooming and try in order to remove the plant completely. They are very, very fast growing and they spread very, very quickly. These um, sterile versions are being sold in stores in some places, but they are supposed to be sterile. So it is uh, different varieties than, than what has been sold in the past. English ivy, uh, they do have a shallow root system, which can cause problems to erosion uh, once other species are completely moved out. Because of that, they also can be easier to, to dig up. So once you've cut the vines back off of trees, you can actually kind of almost roll the plants up. If you get a pitchfork or a garden fork underneath and loosen those roots up, you can just kind of roll them out. You just do want to be careful that you're doing it at a time when you can plant something directly after since you are removing the root system from that soil you don't want to cause any sort of erosion issues 
And then lastly, looking at giant hogweed, which forms dense canopies that displaces natives and also increases the risk of soil erosion because of their shallow root system. Um, you can dig them out going at least six inches down to remove that main core, but you do need to be careful because they're sap and um, parts of the plant can cause issues, um, skin irritation. And then the Himalayan blackberry, I think many of us know this one. Um, they are displacing native plant species and preventing water flow in different types of streams and irrigation dishes. So um, repeatedly cutting them down in early fall. So generally it's around September after they've bloomed and before they fully go to fruit um, is the best time to cut them down from the main stem and dig them out. Once again, you do need to be careful about any sort of erosion issues. Um, so looking at maybe cutting them down that first season and digging them out the following year and making sure that you're planting something to replace so you don't have erosion problems down the road. And with that, um, thank you very much. And um, please feel free to call the garden hotline. We are there to answer questions Monday through Saturday, nine to five. And you can also email us any types of pictures or questions at help at gardenhotline.org. Thank you very much, Selena. That was a ton of information. You moved through it really quickly, but <laughs> you you covered a ton. Um, so we will post a, a PDF of the slides from tonight on the City of Bothell's website. We should have that done by the end of the week, as well as the video recording of this workshop, assuming technology is cooperating this time. So now we are ready to begin the Q&A session. We're scheduled to go until 8.30. We already have a couple really great questions. Um, if you think of some while Selena's answering these ones, you can use the chat or you could use the raise hand feature or if there's an awkward silence, just jump in and ask your question. We, will, we might ask you to unmute anyway if we have a question about your question. And I think now also at the beginning, I mentioned we had a few more questions to ask at the end of the workshop. And if you answer those, then you can be entered into a prize drawing for one of the two gardening books that I mentioned, or there's a $25 gift card to Mulbax, or a 90 minute consultation with either Selena or one of her coworkers at Tilt Alliance. They'll come out and assess your yard and give you recommendations and great ideas for um, how to make it work the way you want it to. So make sure I covered everything I need to cover before I jump into these questions. Okay. All right, so I'm just gonna go in the order that they were asked. First question is, is there something organic you can treat leaves with to avoid leaf-borne diseases? I've had issues with using the leaves in my yard in that I find they contribute to fungi in my food crops later on. I'm muted, okay. Um, <laughs> So leaf borne diseases, so I'm, the one thing that comes to mind is powdery mildew, um, which is a fungus that unfortunately living in the Northwest, you're probably every person is gonna have at some point. Um, I would definitely recommend if you have any sort of fungal issues on your leaves to put them in, not in your home compost and to put them into the city waste to go away. You can't heat your own compost up hot enough to be able to kill any of those funguses. So you need to not use those in your own garden. Um, one thing you can do if you do have a really bad powdery mildew problem um, is you can create a spray that is um, a baking soda spray. And so what baking soda does is it changes the pH on the leaf so that the mildew won't actually form there. Um, but you are potentially going to have a problem. Some plants are susceptible to it. Um, roses oftentimes are, it's really hard to have them not have powdery mildew. So making sure you have good air circulation and that you're not watering on the leaves and you're actually watering at the base of the plant to help with that. Okay, and I wanted to mention one thing as you're taking the poll, you might notice question five isn't really a question, just choose one or the other answer and um, we're, we'll disregard oh, okay. that one. <laughs> oh, funny. Yeah, I don't know what that was about. Sorry. Yeah, no, no. Worries. I missed that one. Our next question is, I have a two foot wide creek that runs the length of my property. The ground is very wet along it. What can I grow in very wet soil alongside it to keep the creek in its bed? Right now I have wild iris. 
And then as you talked about wild iris later on, same same person followed up with, oh no, so should I pull out all of my wild iris? It if, it's my the, if it's the yellow flag iris, it's not a native iris. So that's kind of looking at making, because there are native irises, that would be just fine. Um, I would just be careful about making sure they're not spreading and taking over. Um, some other things, um, reeds, there's different reeds that would grow well in there. Um, trying to think of what other high moisture loving, um, I mean, things like small dogwoods. Um, there's some dwarf dogwoods that would do good in a wetter environment. Um, and also if you send us an email, I can give you a better list too. Um, unfortunately, I won't be able to remember enough to tell you right off the top of my head. Right. So feel free to email the hotline or you can also send me a private message with your email and I can give you some more information later. We can, are you able to put, put up that final screen again? Just the one with the garden hotline oh, yeah. contact info? Yeah, yeah. Okay, you can just leave it up for a few more minutes while yeah. people finish the poll. Great. And I will move on to the next question, which is, we are talking about how to invite wildlife to our yards, but I would also like to know how to discourage some, like blue jays and squirrels. Three years running, we've had beautiful little swallow nests and the babies have never made it. Hmm. Let's um, squirrel, I mean, it's unfortunately there, I don't, I'm trying to think with squirrels, I have squirrel problem in my own yard. Um, one thing that I end up doing is making sure the nests, like after the babies are gone is taking the nest out of the tree and that will help to keep them from, um, they'll kind of move on to a new space. Um, in larger areas that can be harder to do. Um, I would say encouraging some different types of predatory birds to be around because they're going to end up going after the squirrels or after the blue jays uh, or the cellar jays. Um, I don't know specifically what predators would keep them out. They're obviously going to be there because of you've created a nice wildlife habitat for them. Um, but yeah, specifically those two, I mean, they're hard because we live in an urban environment where we also have those types of animals have learned how to flourish in those types of environments. So it is really hard to keep those two um, out. Um, making sure that you're not putting bird seed out that they're both coming at because they are both opportunistic type of animals and they're gonna come and find um, what is ever around for them too. If I can offer another do not do this. We recently had um, a situation where a resident was trying to get rid of some pests in their yard. And so they covered their pretty much their whole yard with mothballs, which you, you cannot do that. So they're highly toxic. <laughs> and one of the neighbors smelled what was going on. So she called us and yeah. code enforcement was out there. So although maybe that could be an effective way, it's not a legal way. And please don't 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 use mothballs for things right. they're not intended for. Next so I question. also see bats. Oh, I just yes. was reading the next. So bats. Um, yes. Bats are the the number of bats that have rabies is very very low um, in our area. So I would not worry about bats being around, they're more beneficial than they are something to be concerned about. You obviously don't want bats in your home. So making sure that you have um, all the little nooks and crannies and possible ways for them to get in patched up um, because that is when you potentially will have a problem. They're not gonna come after you unless you're disturbing them. And that's pretty much when that's gonna happen is if they're in your home. So making sure you have any cracks or anything like that patched up, um, but bats are really a great thing to have in in your um, out in your yard. Okay. The last question that I see so far is we have a new development across our small creek. Developer was required to work on the riparian area and they've planted numerous western red cedars approximately five to six feet apart and right up next to an existing fir and hemlock that are a hundred plus years old. Isn't that entirely too close? Uh, yeah, I mean, that seems, that seems very close to me. 
Um, or very large trees. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> often, unfortunately, what oftentimes happens is that it's um, things are planted with a um, make it look full fast and not a how is it going to look down the road or how is it going to be maintained down the road because people that are adding stuff in aren't the ones maintaining it um unfortunately and that's oftentimes when we end up having issues with diseases or pest problems too is because things were overly planted and then you're having to do a lot of pruning um, they're stressed out because they don't have enough root space um, to grow um so yes i would say that's too close um but i don't know entirely what you could potentially they are going to be slower growing so it's going to take a while but um it will potentially cause problems down the road so there, some of them are probably going to end up dying because they're going to out get outcompeted with something else. So if anyone else has any more questions, we still have a little bit of time left to pick Selena's brain. If you have a question, you're welcome to just jump in and ask it or type it. And also feel free to email or send pictures later. So, oh yeah. Here's one, I'm concerned um, about erosion caused by mole activity. Is this something to be concerned about? And if so, what's a good way to control them? Yeah, moles, um, I mean, if they're, if they're on like a hillside, that might be something to be slightly concerned about, but generally moles aren't, I mean, they're, they are burrowing, they're not making extents. I mean, they're making a little bit of tunnels. It's usually not something we worry about with erosion issues. Um, if you are on a critical slope or something like that, then you might want to worry a little bit more about it. Uh, it's definitely not something you need to worry about with like your foundation or anything like that. Um, that has been questions that I've gotten in the past. Um, but some things you can do, they don't like really strong smells. So some things that people have tried is um, taking like mint or rosemary and blending it up in a blender and then adding it to like hot water and pouring it down their holes um that is one thing the one thing with moles is that it does mean you have really good worm activity so you have healthy soil so they're there because you have healthy soil so something to think about um they are very hard to be able to to control because they're kind of they're moving around a lot um but like i said the the pouring of hot water down with the mint or stuffing mint and other really strong smelling stuff down there is one thing that i've that i've seen there's a handful of other techniques um, that i just can't remember off the top of my head so send us an email and we can find the um, that list for you also we have another question about biochar what do you have any thoughts on biochar specifically to control nutrient runoff um, I don't have a ton of experience with biochar. It's not something that we generally see um, here in our environment because of the type of soils we have. It's not something that's commonly used. That being said, it doesn't mean it's not a good one to use. It's just not something we teach about oftentimes. Um, and so I don't know if it's the if I'm the best person without doing a little bit more research to be able to comment on. Um, it's used a lot of times in very um, in very arid environments to help with adding nutrients back into the soils. Um, and we just, we don't have that type of environment here. So to specifically control nutrient runoff, I mean, a lot of our nutrient runoff is due to um, the leaching of the soils from rains. And so protecting that soil is really gonna help with that. The biochar is gonna add nutrients into the soil. Um, so yeah, if you want to send an email, I can I can do some more some more hunting and research on that. Um, like I said, it's not something that I have a ton of experience on. Okay, another question. This was about the trees that were planted most likely mm, too close mm -hmm. together. Do we have any recourse? Who would we contact? They supposedly hired an environmental company, but I seriously fear for the existing row of the fir or hemlock. Um, if it, if this is within Bothell city limits, I would start with our, with community development. Um, they, if you call the main desk and tell them what it is, they're either going to put you in touch with permitting, or they might put you in touch with our development review staff directly, who probably would have been the ones to look at these plans. So that would, um, 
that would be the best place to start if you're within the city. Catherine, did you have another question? I just saw your hand raised. I was also going to mention too, I wouldn't worry as much about the existing trees as I would for all the new ones that were planted. Um, if these existing trees are as big as it seems that being 100 plus years old, their root systems are going to be so extensive that um, the other trees are not going to compete with those root systems. I, I wouldn't think um, it would be more of all of the new stuff that they put in that I think we're are probably going to end up having having more issues. But there is going to be competition for roots within all of that. So it depends, I guess, also how much they dug down and what they did as they were planting them. Yeah, I have a few houses near me where they planted these large trees so close to the house and it's, yeah. they're pretty much this much space in between the tree and the house. And yeah, it's- I was wondering, did you not know it was gonna grow? <laughs> I, they don't honestly care sometimes, which yeah. is really unfortunate. Being a landscaper for over 10 years, I've had to deal with a lot of stuff that was planted that the homeowner is then wondering why it's dying. It's well, cause it wasn't, it wasn't thought out that in 10 years, it's going to look like this. So, yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. Well, I want to mention one more thing. If you think of any questions while I'm talking, type them or raise your hand. But I did want to mention we have it's not necessarily part of the natural yard care series that we did this year, but we are doing an Earth Day container gardening class with Selena this Saturday. We have two sessions, a morning and an afternoon, and we still got some spots available. Um, we've got 12 inch shallow planting bowls and we'll have a few flowers and herbs that you can plant in them. We've got the soil, the gloves, everything. We just um, want the people to come and you'll learn even more about pollinators and then have something pretty cool to, to take home. And, make it they will come something yeah. like that <laughs> so you can if you're interested in that you can sign up on well i think i put it i put the link in the chat a little bit ago but it's i'll add it again it's just bothelaw.gov slash earth day of course it didn't hyperlink it there but <laughs> picture never, never does when you want it to i know i know the whole thing. Okay. Well, I don't see any other questions or raised hands. Last call. <laughs> All right. Selena, thank you again. You're always You're a welcome. wealth of knowledge. And yeah. I always learn something new. I think we've been doing this series for, well, I've been in this role almost five, five years now. And so you you really are an engaging person to listen to and i appreciate you. appreciate that <laughs> of mm -hmm. course okay thank you everyone for coming and i hope we'll see some of you on saturday if not i hope you find um whatever way floats your boat to celebrate earth month this month yes thank you everyone have a great night thanks <laughs>